I'm still not used to this intro. This is still a new intro to me. It's like day three and I'm still not used to it. But anyway, whatever. <laughs> Jose Young said, MAFighting.com here for another Wednesday edition of the A Side live chat. Now, I had to make sure it was Wednesday before we went on air. But of course, uh, joining me is, as always, is my Wednesday Friday co host, PT Carroll. And joining us is last month, this past Monday, Elias Theodore became the first Canadian fighter on the A Side live chat. Now it's two days in a row. Joining us is Sarah Kaufman. Sarah, how are you? How's life in quarantine these days? Oh, well, it's uh, it's quarantine you know. I've been doing lots of puzzles, reading books, hiking. So, I mean, I guess it's good. I just want to punch people in the face a bit more. And yes. by that, I mean at all. Sure. <laughs> PC has the same problems, right, PC? <clears throat> yeah, but like they, they aren't allowed to even try to hit me back. <laughs> that, that's that's a stipulation I need, and I need to be faster than them. So I'm very slow at the moment, which I found out by running my first five k of all time the other day. So uh, yeah, I've got a lot to work on before I can start hitting people again. I feel. Yeah. And Casey, yeah, how's life with you? I hear there was a big uh, earthquake in your neck of the woods the other uh, yesterday, right? Yes. So at about what time? About midnight last night. Me and Esther were were pretty much asleep. And then all of a sudden, like, we're just about sleeping. And then we just hear this, like, it felt like a giant was outside our house and just kind of stubbed his toe in our house. So the house was <laughs> like that. And it was so loud. And, like, you just, like, ah! like that. And, like, you just, oh, am I dreaming it? Wait, oh, no, it really happened. And, like, but you, you just kind of wait for the aftershock and it never came. So, uh, yeah, it was just a... Uh, we're just like, oh, not today. I just don't need an earthquake right now. Like maybe, <laughs> maybe in a couple months. I don't know, but like, uh, yeah. So, uh, so it's interesting though. So when, as soon as the earthquake happens, you're like, oh crap! I better put some clothes on because I'm gonna run out to the street <laughs> butt naked. I don't know. <laughs> so, so I'm like, where are my glasses? <laughs> and the house is kind of shaking still. But um, yeah, it was fun. And then, but so. But part of the fun part about earthquakes is earthquake Twitter is such a thing now because you have mm-hmm. to, as soon as it happens, you're like, okay, I'm alive. So you get you grab your Twitter, grab your phone, because you don't know am I in am I in the, am I in the middle of the earthquake or am I in the very like outskirts? It's like oh, look on your phone, oh, San Francisco's gone. You don't know. So, <laughs> so, but so, just, t- but, yeah, so we out, learned Casey sleeps yeah. naked. That's the yeah. big thing we take away from this. Casey sleeps naked. Uh, Sarah Pizza, have you guys experienced earthquakes before? Uh, I live on a fault line, mm-hmm. so literally since I was in like grade two, I was like seven or eight. We've been doing or second grade, as you would say in the U.S. Uh, is that what you guys say? What do you guys say for second grade? That's yeah, about what second, seven, second. eight years old. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, so we used to do earthquake drills all the time. We'd like hide under desks and like practice our protocols. Cause they've said for, you know, 20 something years or longer that we're right on the precipice of a massive one meter drop. Cause our Island's right. fault line goes underneath another one. So they always say that we're going to get a whole bunch of little earthquakes and then eventually have one massive one and we're going to drop a meter and it's going to be horrific. So, uh, fortunately we haven't yet dropped a meter and, We've had small earthquakes, but nothing real big. PZ, is this all just jargon to you? Yeah, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. But <laughs> I, I woke up this morning, and um, obviously I'm eight hours ahead of Casey and Esther. And I see all these, like, shocked things, like, happening. And I, I was still waking up, and I was like, uh, what the fuck is Dana White after doing now? That was the first thing that crossed my mind. I was like, oh, for God's sake, what's happening now? And then I was like, oh, thank God, it's only an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> just an earthquake i was in uh casey and i were in vegas in july for that crazy earthquake during international fight week it was the middle of the ufc hall of fame henry cejudo almost ran out of the building and uh our former co co-worker mark raymondi uh, i've never seen someone more scared about anything in my entire life he his exact words were i'm from new york i don't know how to deal with this and ran away so uh Good memories when it comes to earthquakes. But, of course, this is not our podcast. This is your all's podcast. You can ask any question you guys want, MMA or non-MMA related. Uh, I still remember, Pete, and I still remember that excellent episode where we devolved into a 45-minute conversation about Bigfoot with Michael Chiesa. Uh, So we could talk about anything you all want. Sarah, you're in the Pacific Northwest, right? Correct? Uh, Yes. 
Uh, yes, in Canada, the... yes. Yes. But in Canada, uh, we, we would consider the Pacific oh. Northwest, would be, is where we'd be northeast, set, we'd be southwest. Southwest. But anyway. So you, you are in the Pacific Southwest. Do you believe in Bigfoot? <laughs> no. Wow. <sighs> Controversial. What about the skunk ape? The what? The skunk ape. The skunk ape? There is. I only heard about it recently. Michael Chiesa, who lives in Washington, gave us a 45 minute lecture on the differences between the Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yetis, and skunk apes. Skunk apes apparently are 100% confirmed, and there's photos of them in the Everglades, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Casey? Yeah, it's basically the Bigfoot of Florida. Yeah. Except it's they actually real. have a, they actually have like a, le- a legitimate photo of it, not just a grainy one. Uh, so, so where con- the skunk apes live in Florida, that's where the UFC is going to be. Yeah, Boyd Island <laughs> and skunk apes are real. Yeah, perfect. That's yes. the main event. Ferguson versus skunk ape. <laughs> Ferguson oh, versus skunk ape. I would pay ape. for that. I'm telling you, like you'll pay money, but you know what? I hear the skunk ape ain't going to make weight, so he's not eligible for bonus. Uh, it's a bummer. That's a bummer. <laughs> but anyway. You can ask any question you want on Twitter, the site. Casey's got them. What's our first question this week or today? I should okay. say. First question. Here we. Uh, yeah. From at the seaside on Twitter. Favorite th- favorite three Ooh. things to do during quarantine. Hashtag the A side. So, excellent question, seaside. Sarah, what are your three favorite things to do to pass the time during quarantine? Uh, <clears throat> I'm a little bit insane. So anytime I do really any activity, I do it for like incredibly long blocks of time. So like I've been, you know, I'll pick up a book, but then I have to finish the book within like two or three sittings. So I've read, I think three, four books so far, but over the Ooh. course of like two days each, just like rip through it. Oh. Uh, I'm currently doing a 3000 piece puzzle, which is a terrible, terrible, terrible decision. Uh, I'm doing it on my floor because it's so big. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just doing, like, fill the time kind of things. I've been doing definitely a lot more hikes. And, I mean, I live in a pretty beautiful place that we have lots of mountains and trails. And I can get out and, and do that. Uh, so, really, that's it. And, sadly, not punching people or choking people. Right. What books have you read? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I read one, uh, The Neuroscientist Who Lost Her Mind, uh, which is pretty interesting. It's like this lady who's a neuroscientist, and then she gets brain cancer and uh, goes insane and then kind of comes back from that insanity, and so it's kind of her experience. Uh, I read one called A House in the Sky. Wait, is that, a, is that fiction? Is that nonfiction? What is that? Uh, all nonfiction. Oh, so it's a true, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a autobiography? It's like a, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, A House in the Sky was really good. It's uh, uh, a Canadian, actually, was over in Somalia and got taken and held for ransom. And she was held for 15 months uh, in Somalia. Jesus. And so it was kind of like her journey and her experience of going over there and ma- kind of making decisions that got her stuck with uh, this guy that was there with her. And um, So I, I kind of try and read somewhat informative but kind of autobiographical things i don't know i also like murder mysteries but i just haven't read any lately uh what is the puzzle of i know casey's a big puzzler right casey well i esther's a big puzzler and yes, i Esther's just sit i watch her do puzzles and i go this is this is like gonna take a long time <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and then, I did. And then, I did then I help actually, out for a little bit, and I I find one you know uh, side piece, and I go, yeah, you had never done this about me. <laughs> I, I, deserve, I deserve half the credit now because I got one. I found one piece. I actually, uh, I feel like most of my friends know I like puzzles, so I've been gifted a lot mm. of very challenging puzzles. Um, earlier, earlier, la- later last year, a little while ago, I did a all entirely one color yellow puzzle. So it was just one color. <laughs> that sounds uh, brutal. <laughs> it was not the most fun, but but great that I got it finished. Well, you're, the, you're, um, those, you're those insane people that buy that puzzle. Just yeah. 
That's black belt. That's black belt and puzzling. That's a black belt and puzzling. That's that's yeah. no, that's that's quarantine insanity puzzle. That's like I the have I'm, lots of time. Yeah, the what I'm doing now is I mean 3000 pieces is huge, so it's 4 feet by 3 feet. The actual Whoa. like size of the puzzle and it's pretty much like a muted scene of like a field with some rocks, like but light, lighter rocks with some an like a deer and two other smaller animals that are brown, and all of the pieces kind of look like the same shade. Oh no! So just the sorting was a nightmare. Uh, I don't know. I'm like maybe 12, 15 percent done. I have a lot oh, left. Yeah. Pizza, you're a born puzzler, right? No man, I have no patience. <laughs> I just lose my shit. Like I can't do anything. It's terrible. I wish I had more patience. I'm actually even trying to read again now, and I'm getting angry with the books. It's it's terrible. But I'm 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 trying to like I'm thinking about doing exercise a lot. I'm not doing much of it. I'm thinking about it though. I'm mentally preparing myself for the exercise. That's how I feel like I'm doing at the moment. And if, I'm I'm like just eating a lot. You know what I mean? Because you need to carb load before you're gonna put on a lot of muscle. So that's sure. that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Sure. You stretching? It's good logic. Oh, I'm at, like I mean, I'm thinking about stretching. So I mean, I feel like I'm halfway there. Well, well I, I, maybe just get like a little stretching while we before we yeah. really get you know, into the hard questions, Pizzi. Let me. So, Sarah, did are you aware that oh, Pizzi is one of, if not the most flexible man in the world? Here we go. Oh. We're gonna. She just wanna see? new guest. Oh, Hang on. This, this is a, the new guest. Always gets. The <laughs> wait, wait, wait! Sarah's like it's disgusting before it starts. <laughs> What do you think of that? Huh? I mean, that's pretty impressive. Who, who needs to work out with these body mechanics? That's what I want to know. All right, you're I actually again. To, your turn, Sarah. I used on, to Sarah. train with... Uh, oh. Yes. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, that's all I got. I'm not very flexible here. That just hurts. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to train with a guy, um, Brian Schaefer, who... I mean... He doesn't live here right now, but for like 10 years, we've been training together. The most flexible human on the planet. But he's now developed like you'll be in top side control. And all you're doing is staying there and realizing like, I don't know what is next to my head. It could be a <laughs> foot. It could be his far foot. Like you just never know. And like where the things are coming from and what he's using. It's incredible. He's so good. But it's just an entirely different experience rolling with someone who has the flexibility, but then the weird strength in that flexibility, because a normal position that you would be super dominant and controlling in, he turns it around and you're getting submitted. It's, uh, it's a pretty incredible thing. So, uh, you know, Pete, you could work on that and actually gain some skill with. Yeah. I, did, I used to train jujitsu a lot, like, and I'm not messing. I used to just give arm bars up so I could get out of uh, bottom positions. Right. I was mounted. I just like hold my arms up and get like triangled. So I knew I'd get out of it. But a few times, like remember when I was a white belt, I got like my arm broke nearly. Like, I mean, I, I yeah. was like, oh, I'll just give this, this arm up. And a guy just nearly ripped my, and then everyone across the gym was like, ah, they just hear me screaming. Like, guess he's not that flexible after all. <laughs> that, that's me in the gym when I watch people getting submitted and like, they don't want to tap. And I, I just, ah, that's a tap. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah. We actually have oh, one guy who around. I, I, yeah. I see people's faces turning green. Oh. Like, and I'll be in an arm bar and I'll be like, Pete, please stop, stop. <laughs> Girls are the worst. I never try. I try to never armbar girls because they either won't tap because they think you're not mean enough to break it, or they're like, "What? It doesn't hurt," and they're just so bendy that you either have to be willing to break it or just let it go. So I much prefer to choke uh, pretty much any female versus armbar if I had the choice. It is that, isn't it? Because it, it's it's actually a course being flexible when when you're trying jujitsu because <laughs> it doesn't hurt at all and then it breaks. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's it's not like you, you're you're going, oh yeah, this is a piece of piss. This is nothing to me. It's like it doesn't piece feel of... like anything, and then suddenly it's like, ah, your life yeah. is over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what she K said. <laughs> Casey, how many <laughs> arms do you break? <laughs> no, no arms, no arms. <laughs> no arms. <laughs> yeah. I kicked Sarah in the face once, though. Wow. He did. Whoa. He actually punched me really hard in the face one time, he too. He's like, oh, I've never sparred. Like, be really nice. And so he's like, la, 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 la. Whoa! 
<laughs> and he thought it was hilarious. I mean, I thought it was pretty funny too. But Esther was there, and she was like, "Casey," but then I just kicked him back, so it was fine. Well, you call spar, and we call a normal day at MMA fighting when it yeah. comes to Casey. He beats all of us, all of us, especially PT. Whenever, whenever we're doing interviews, like we're on last question, and the reason why we know it's in the last question because Case just punches in the back of the head. <laughs> right. I'm oh, bored. Uh, I'm bored. <laughs> At least he gives us a heads up. Alex K. Lee just hits us. Yeah. Don't ask about the scars. Another yeah, I mean, Casey, Casey's not stealth. You see it coming, but he yeah. hits pretty hard. Like it's, yeah. He is good power for someone who's not super fit. Although I know you're <laughs> a bit more fit now. A bit more. A bit more. Have you, have, you, boy, have, have, you, have you trained with him since he grew the mustache? Because I feel it will increase his stealthiness by maybe 50%. I haven't. That is a good theory. See? Sarah, it's just something I wanted to throw out there, just so you'll be aware of it when it comes, you know? Mm-hmm. He moves a lot quicker with that stash. <laughs> Next question. Next question. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, my. It wouldn't be the A side if we didn't veer off into a tangent. <laughs> from, from Robin G87 on the site, a six feet society. If we have to get used to a six feet society with the. Exceptions for competing athletes for entertainment. It would mean for the foreseeable future, MMA events will be without attending fans. If that continues all the way into 2021, will there be a lasting effect of bankrupt MMA organizations? And would that include big ones like Bellator and the UFC? So this question is asking if there are no fans for the foreseeable future, will that affects a lot of organizations i assume he's asking about smaller organizations because i can't imagine bellator and ufc will be hit that well i'm sure they'll be hit obviously without ticket sales but it will really affect those of those organizations that do rely on ticket sales so sarah i'll start with you uh if this continues will this what do you think the lasting effects will be on mma organizations i assume he's asking about local smaller shows yeah, so I think any show that doesn't have a TV deal, it's going to be a big issue. Like any show that really relies on just the fans to carry the show, they're going to struggle. Um, but I think that honestly, for anyone who has a TV deal, in some ways, um, it might not be the worst because right. there are a lot of promotions. Um, you know, that don't necessarily have huge crowds in general or struggle to get the ticket sales. And in doing so, it almost has, if you have the live event and they pan to the crowd and there's 10 people in the crowd, it actually is worse off because you have that feeling of, oh, nobody wants to come watch this. It's a weird energy. You don't get that same vibe. So if everyone is on close sets, it's a bit more of an even playing field. And really the fights are what are going to be the selling features. Um, so I think for organizations that have the the viewership in terms of their TV deals, but maybe don't have the sales and in some ways are paying these big venues to use the space, but then aren't filling them and aren't recouping that money, it might actually be a better thing for them. Uh, mm-hmm. But the small organizations that are local and just do, you know, amateur shows or pro-ams or anything like that, those are going to struggle for sure because they have no revenue aside from uh, the actual ticket sales unless right. they develop some kind of online platform where people could pay to to watch. And then, again, maybe you'd see the numbers actually go up for those. Yeah, my first thought were, the, were these those smaller organizations where the fighters actually sell the tickets at their gyms and they get some cut of like those type of promotions. I again, I assume that's what this individual is asking. Pete, what do you what about uh, what do you have to say on this about especially across the pond where you have so many smaller organizations? A lot of these these younger up and coming UK fighters eventually that want to get into the cage wars in the UFC have to start somewhere. Yeah, I mean, well, Cage Warriors would be the main feeder to uh, the UFC in this neck of the woods. So I guess it's important to, uh, you know, the 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 health of that organization is very important to the European scene, the UK and Ireland in particular, when it's paved the way to for a hundred fighters to the UFC. Um, they have already have plans to put on events behind closed doors when restrictions ease in the UK. It's quite bad there at the moment. Um, but I, I have a feel like I mean. I'm thinking about what Sarah said there, and I think they can exist 
from event to event when they have that crowd there. I have a feeling that, like, you know, they might have a crowd of 2,000 people average for an event. I'm not too sure about that. But you'd assume that that gate is, is paying for some of the fighters as well. So I really don't know. But I think it's a promising sign that Graham Boylan has come out and said, look, as soon as those restrictions are eased and people can um, work to a certain extent anymore, they will be putting them on. So I guess that is a good sign. Um, but I know KSW... Um, you know, I, I spoke to Martin Lewandowski at the very start of this thing, and he was like just logistically trying to put on an international event in Poland is, is a disaster, really. You know, trying to fly people in from all over different parts of the world to compete. Uh, what stage um, of, is, is the virus at in these different nations? What is the social responsibility of bringing these fighters into Poland if everyone else is observing these um, these restrictions? So I think it's it's very difficult. It's going to be very difficult to put the shows on to get them over the line, um, and hopefully it won't have an impact. But I, I do think it will uh, at the end of the day. Just uh, numbers on the ground will have a bigger impact for say not not the big leagues, the likes of the Bell the Bellator, UFCs, PFLs. They won't feel the same impact. But I do feel as though the uh, the kind of feeding grounds for them promotions will. Sarah, if offered a fight, would you take it at, the, at during this amid this coronavirus pandemic right now? If someone came up to you, say later today, and said we have a fight for you, would you accept it? Um, I mean, BC, where I am, it's not like on lockdown. It's not saying you can't go or you can't be around, but it's. I mean, they've been talking about finding people if they are around others. So legitimately, I have done zero physical contact training. Um, I've hit the bag a little bit. Um, I've done pads a couple times, uh, you know, like out in a park. Uh, and then I'm just doing lots of workouts. But in terms of actual grappling, jujitsu, wrestling, MMA sparring, I've done zero of that. Um, now, that being said, at this point, I'm fully ready to go. Like, I want to be training. And I feel like if I'm healthy and other people are healthy, I'd like to find a solution in the coming weeks to make that happen. Uh, and so if I had the opportunity to fight, I think what likely I would do uh, is I would just move in with a training partner or two training partners and live in somewhat tight quarters that I would not enjoy because I like my alone time and personal time and being away from people because I like being alone. Mm -hmm. But I would for sure sacrifice that if it meant that I got to train with potentially the opportunity to fight. Um, I just don't know what that looks like because I feel at this point the logistics of everything involved. I think I could figure out the training with a few key people. You don't need 25 people. You need mm -hmm. two. You could even get away with one good training partner. I considered if it was allowed even moving to Vegas and living with Joanne Calderwood and then we could just train together. Um, just logistically with the countries and the borders uh, and the recommendation to not travel, you know, if I were down there and then got hurt, I don't True. know that I would be able to be covered. Or even if I got sick, I don't know that uh, medically I could get covered. So it just might not be a smart decision, but I have for sure considered it and even looked into flights just kind of on a whimsy, knowing that it probably wouldn't happen. So I think you could figure out a way to train enough for a fight but i think the logistics of actually where is this fight and who else is coming in and what precautions are being taken um would be a big factor whether it actually happens or not are you still with pfl sarah or uh yes i'm still under contract with pfl right now um we were kind of in the process of uh r literally right before all this went down i had been talking with ray quite a bit um, kind of on like what potentially the next season looks like and, and different logistics that way. Um, as of right now, I'm still uh, signed with them and under contract with them. Um, and they just announced that they're not doing any fights until 2021 now. So it's kind of a... a and yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so if I you mean, get that monthly stipend like, that they were talking about, I hope you, you are. They, they, they said they were... Um, you know, contracted fighters will be put on a monthly stipend as well as moving the, the fights back. Does that apply to you? Yeah, I got an email about it, and I think that, that Ray has talked to John about it as well. Um, I don't know all the details yet. Um, it's it's pretty awesome that they are willing to yeah. try and be supportive in a way, um, even though they're not, you know, 
the biggest organization, but they do have some decent funding and they really are trying to do what's best for the fighters and put the fighters first. Uh, but I mean, it is a long time between now and next May mm-hmm. for the season to start. And so I haven't fought since last October. You know, it's, it's, it's a long time to sit. So I definitely hope to be able to get in some kind of competing. But I mean, I'm surprised that May 9th is even going to go. Yeah. To be honest, like it just, it just seems like it's such a stretch to be trying to force these events to happen and, and how are people training for them and do they have partners or are they just ignoring the social distancing and just getting together? And I even saw a photo Yoel Romero put up with him and like 10 guys and they have masks on half of them are not even really on. And it's like, is that really doing anything? Right. It's probably not. But at the same time I get it cause I want to train and like, might consider doing that at some point it just doesn't seem the most responsible right now to be trying to force a fight for may 9th unless again you're living with all the people you're training with i know even amanda, that amanda nunez pulled go out ahead. of the fight right because she wanted a full camp she was supposed to fight felice spencer on that or featherweight uh title defense but she's like i want a full camp so she's not she's already <laughs> off that card and they haven't even officially announced it yet wait was that fight supposed to be may 9th in sao paulo yeah. So, no, yeah. that was going to be in Sao Paulo, but then it got bumped to the super card with all the title fights. But with, still, so but it, was, it, was on the, it was on the same date, though, right? Yeah, but then yeah, when I, I, I assume when that I assume when it got when the 250 was going to be no more, and then they were talking about Fight Island and this and that, she might have stopped camp. I don't quite know. Maybe there was a lot of up in the air. Maybe she thought it had officially been canceled, but as far as I know, she's not fighting on the May 9th card. See, I was I was confused by that because she said, she said it was short notice, but it sounded more like just because. Uh, the restrictions and training, that's why she pulled out, not because it's short notice. Maybe. I guess, yeah. Either way, I mean, I get it. I definitely yeah, know. I think it's probably one of those things, too, where you think, okay, well, no, it'll be fine. You know, I'll be able to fight. But then when it comes down to it, the training is different. And especially for someone like Amanda, who is currently on this crazy high, you know, like huge run that she's on. She's up super impressive. Um, you don't want to just fight for the purpose of fighting, especially she's probably in a position now where she doesn't need the money. You know, she has a kid on the way. She has a lot going on. And then also with, with the restrictions of just being around people, I'm sure that the training is different. Even if you're training with one person or two people or you're hitting mitts, it's just not the same as, as having your trusted people around you. So I for sure get that, you know, with all this on again, off again, moving the cards, maybe it's going to happen here that instability um you know like let's just wait what's the rush fight in june uh, had, fight in July. we had had uh, jojo on a uh, euro bash a couple of weeks back i think it was three weeks ago and obviously at the time it was in that interview that she kind of uh, revealed that the the date for the shevchenko fight would be pushed back and she was saying she had a training partner in quarantine that was just leaving to spar her and go back into quarantine every time it's like it seems like so much to ask of your training partners even, right? Like, it's really, really, um, the, the situation is just so insane. Like, it, it's hard to even get your head around how you'd put a camp together. You know, it's insane. Yeah, I, I think ultimately you'd want to live with the person um, because then you know what they're doing outside of when they're not with you. Mm-hmm. If you want to go by the recommendations of staying within your small group, not doing extra, you know, not spreading germs, not collecting germs from anywhere else. And if you're not living with the person, there's just that chance that their house carries it or someone else's house carries it or the, you know, anywhere they're going. And so just the risk, crazy. you know, it gets exponentially larger, the the less control you have of it. So uh, when Jessica Andrade moved in with her training partner, um, that like that made sense to me. It was like, yeah, this makes sense. You live together, you train together. There's no issue. Um, And even then, if someone doesn't feel well, you quarantine them and kind of isolate them out, too, so that you don't get sick. And I know Joanne actually did get sick. And in part, I think it's because her training partner actually went to a different spot to just just to work out, not to necessarily do any kind of contact, you know, and, and it's not a direct correlation, but it is, you know, she did get sick and then, you know, had to take some time off as well. So it's it's just so easy to spread. That, that it's definitely of a concern and, and how they're going to bring in I've even the logistics of you bring in a fighter and even if you only let them have one corner, if you have a card with 12 fights, that's 50 people. 
just yeah. between one fighter and one corner. And most people bring two corners or a training partner. Um, so already you have 50 people and then never mind all the airports and everything that they've gone through to get to where they're at. Um, and then if it has potentially four days where you might be, a- and entirely you could be asymptomatic. It's just so hard to, will you know get all those factors in play to have a safe safe event yeah and i mean fighters are so healthy like i mean they're you know they're elite athletes like if there's anyone that's going to be asymptomatic here it's probably going to be you guys you know what i mean like it's because your your immune system are probably so strong from training being on the mat all the time as we know not the cleanest place in the world you know what i mean it's it's like you guys are are really our gym is super clean (laughs) Of course, your gym. I was talking about Casey's match. <laughs> Whoa. For sure, Casey. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. no. Can't trust that mustache. <laughs> this, is, this mustache is disinfected every hour. Don't worry. <laughs> Although right. cutting weight, too. You'd be for sure immunocompromised cutting weight. That's what I was going to say. Actually big, that's actually the big thing. Like I was kind of tweeting, like, okay, if, if they're going to do fights... Please eliminate, or at least everyone fights one weight class up, at least. It's just because that's where, like, I don't know, Sarah, that's where, it's, in my experience watching and being with other fighters and your own experience, when, that during that weight cut and that hard training period, that's when you're actually most susceptible to getting any sort of illness, just in general, right? For sure. And it's, you know, it's like, especially if you've done a full camp, the end of a camp, you're already oftentimes banged up a bit, bruised up. You've been training super hard, so you're maybe a bit run down on top of that. You're dieting down, you're leaning out, you're getting ready to do a water load or uh, whatever kind of cut you do. Um, And every little thing, you know, catches up to you. People get headaches, they get a little bug, they get a cold, they get a flu. Easily people get some kind of bacteria uh, or some kind of food poisoning from deciding that they're going to eat sushi or McDonald's what is that? I, I remember one fight, one guy literally went to McDonald's and got a uh, salad with like the fake chicken on it and then had mad food poisoning for the next day. Um, oh. You know, fighters are idiots. And on top of that, they're, str- you know, straining their bodies and forcing their bodies to go down in weight. Um, I think it would be better if people did fight a weight class up during these times, but just people wouldn't want to do it because... Again, we're idiots, and we just want to, you know, be our leanest self. So, unless it was mandated and forced everyone to fight up a weight class, um, like, except for me, who's fighting up two weight classes right now, sure. most people wouldn't choose to fight bigger people if given the option. Sure. I mean, I never, I never knew fighters were idiots until you told me that story about someone ordering a salad at McDonald's. Come on! <laughs> yeah. God damn it! Uh, it was r- ridiculous. Yeah. It's downright disrespectful. Deserve At to least be get sick. chicken, chicken nuggets or something. <laughs> Absolutely, I agree with you completely. Question on YouTube from anonymous dude one two three. Question: Sarah, are you a fan of open scoring? Do you want to know the score, or would you rather not? Thoughts on open scoring at the last Invicta event? Thank you. So yes, uh, we've talked about this quite a bit on this show. Uh, Casey was a big proponent of open scoring, especially after the, I believe it was what, UFC 247. That was John Jones, Dominic Reyes, and they were, the scoring was all over the place, that whole event. And Victor tried it. We asked all of the champions at that Dominance MMA Media Day. Some of them were for it, some of them were not. Habib was not for it because uh, I, I can't quite remember his reasoning, but he was against it. Kamar Usman was against it. Kayla Harrison was against it. So, Sarah, what are your thoughts on open scoring, and how did you think Invicta handle it? handled it if you saw it? Unfortunately, I didn't see the Invicta event, so I'm not sure how that, that scoring went. Um, I have been at an event in Vancouver up here that did open scoring a mm. few years ago, and I was... Uh, in a corner for it. And at first I legitimately didn't know what was going on because I wasn't aware they were doing open scoring. Um, From a coach standpoint, I think it's a really good thing. Um, Even from a fighter standpoint, I think it's also a good thing. But you're going to have people who end up coasting in some way. Yeah. Um, So it's like people will start protecting the score based on knowing what the score is. Um, 
you know, in a close fight, that matters for sure more. If you think, okay, I'm up two rounds, and then all of a sudden you realize you're down, you're, or it's even, maybe you alter how you're doing that third round. Um, I, I Because of the 10-9 scoring system, I do think it open scoring in some ways would tend to, if someone's up two rounds and they know they're up two rounds, they could literally just play almost keep away for the third round. Mm-hmm. And which is somewhat the smart thing to do. If you know you're winning, you can kind of coast and just not allow the other person to be that effective or effective enough to get a 10, eight score that it makes it hard for the person who's trying to win the fight to get back into it. If someone's just playing, you know, an anti fight game. And then on the other side, it also, it's great for the person who is maybe not lose or not winning. If they know that they're down on the scorecards for sure, it, you know, it's going to be more motivating for them. Um, so, so I think it's a good thing. Like you'd want to know the score in kind of any other game. The one thing that it's not good for is like the, the, the moment of like, and new or, and still Mm -hmm. in a close fight where people are like very invested in those moments because you already know the, the fight ends and immediately you should know who's already won except for the last round to score. So in that sense, from the crowd and from the spectacle of, you know, the, the, the big reveal, yeah. you lose that from a fan standpoint, but from a fighter standpoint, it's very open and, and on the table as to what's going on. And I, I think that I would prefer that because then I know what's going on because I like numbers and I like to, to know what, to know, to know what's up. Casey, that Invicta car, they had it what on an iPad and they would show the corners. Right. And then it was up to the luck. Like, this well, I mean, that the Invicta the... event didn't even really. It had a lot of finishes, and there were a lot of dominant wins, so there was no like, what there there was no controversy. So it it it, it didn't turn out to be one of those cards that would say need it. But uh, they, and then it was, but it was up to the corners whether they told the fighters, right? Yeah, yeah. They they oh, they would okay. hold, they would hold the score and show and show the coach who's talking to the fighter. So it's up to them if they want to go. You lost that round, you know, which they do anyway, you know. So and like and that's. It's you know you've seen lots of times. I mean, Sarah, you've probably experienced experienced this where you most likely won the round, but your coach says, you know, we don't know who won that. Take it like you lost that round. Now you have to, you know, I think it's it's going to change for every fighter, every strategy. That the whole you know, are they going to coast? Are they not going to coast? Are they going to fight hard, fight harder? But uh, Sarah, I would like to ask you though. Um, say I want to take your when you fought Valentina. Now, looking back on it, after you came back from that first round, your coach Adam goes, I know you didn't get hurt, but you lost that round. Like, did you know that in that fight? Or does it, does it even matter at such a high level? Or, I mean, like, what changes in your mind? Or is it, well, so, for, yeah, so for me in that fight, I mean, there were a lot of things going on there. I had, um, like, when I walked out, it was That I like wasn't. I literally walked out and was like, "That's weird. I feel no emotion whatsoever. I wasn't excited. I wasn't nervous. I was just there, um, which was a really weird feeling. And for me to recognize that as I was like, "You love fighting. This is fun. Like, let's go." Uh, and in that fight, you know, I, I was kind of like going through the motions. And at the end of the first round, I was like, "Well, that sucks." And then at the end of the second, round, I was like, "Oh God." Um, and I went back thinking like, okay, well, I clearly have lost both rounds. Um, and when I watched it later, I was like, oh, that fight was actually way closer. Um, you know, because, you know, in the second round, I got back up, but I just stayed there. But then, like, she was doing nothing and I was trying to hit her. So, like, there were things that were going on. But I was just, like, very, like, you know, both Greg and Adam were like, what are you doing? Like, you've lost. And then the third round, when I started started out, I kind of started the same. And then at one point, I picked up a single leg and was like, oh, she kind of fought it. You know, I should just let it go. And then made the decision, you know, I, I'll just her down and easily won the round. I could have done that the whole time. Like, that was ridiculous. But I definitely had that feeling. Like, you know when you – you know how you feel when you've won or lost a round. And so – 
give you a round that you thought you won, or they give you a round that you thought you lost, um, or they don't give you a round you thought you won. So in those close rounds, for sure, it would be more important to know, hey, look, they have you winning this fight, or they gave you that round, so you better win the next one, or, or vice versa. Does that make sense, or was that just a ramble? Maybe that was just rambling. Sorry. I thought it was really interesting, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that was a close fight. I can remember, like, we're watching it from a European perspective. We we're like, oh, shit. You know, like, it, it, it felt really close at the end. So it's just really interesting to hear you speak about it. Yeah. Like, and, and, and do you, you know, when, when you're looking for this emotion inside yourself when you're coming out, is that something you always do? Like, is there something, just a very unique feeling that comes along with having a good night, say? Like, they, do you know you're feeling a certain way? Um, generally, I feel like when I walk out to a fight, I almost always feel the same. It's like, you're a little bit nervous, but I'm super excited. Why am I doing this? I'm an idiot. Like, I have a good record. Uh, I mean, I like what I'm doing, and it's super fun, but, like, you know, I could embarrass myself. Like, there's for sure always these fights, but it's also, like, until I'm actually fighting and until the fight is over... Like, the whole week, I'm like, okay, seven days, and the fight's going to be over. Uh, four wow. days, sleeps, the fight's going to be over. And then as soon as it's over, I'm like, oh, gosh, I just want to do it again. Like, you can't wait until it's over, but then you want to go back. As soon as it's done, you want to go back and do it again. So it's this, like, weird I doing, but also this is so cool. And hmm. almost every fight I've walked out, I'm like, this is amazing. When I fought Valerie Letourneau, it was like my first time kind of like in a big crowd. I was fighting for uh, – GSP was in her corner. And it was, I don't know, like 13,000 people. So one of the bigger crowds. And at the time, like for sure the biggest crowd I'd been in front of. And I walked out first because she was the home. And I walked out and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then she walked out and the crowd was like, ah! Like it was so electric. I mean, it didn't look like such a scary gorilla or bear was chasing me like I just did, but it was like really cool. Like the lights were twinkling. And uh, I took that as like this amazing, I took it in, I like, felt the energy. And one of the guys who was in my corner was like, don't worry about that. Don't let this, you know, don't let them cheering for you. And I turned to him and I was like, hey, they're cheering for her to beat me. They're cheering for me too. Like I took it as a big positive and use that energy. It's just like a feeling you can't really describe unless you've been put in that situation of having the excitement of everyone being, you know, you unanimously almost uh, excited about the event that's about to happen. So that feeling is for sure one of like the, the high having the, the nerves, but the excited nerves. Well, I think this is a perfect segue, Casey, and I think you have a couple photos I lined up. I do. Uh, so, uh, Sarah, so I'm, I'm going to show you some photos from some of your previous fights. I just want you to just talk about the memories you have of that certain photo. So we've already talked about this fight. But um, this, for those of you just listening, oh, this sorry. is Sarah in full mount uh, on current flyweight champion Valentina Shevchenko. So, yes, Sarah, what do you what goes through your mind when you see this photo? So at this exact time of the fight, I could have gotten here and gone to this position. Like I had my coach, Adam, yelling like, like I heard him counting down three minutes left, 2.30, two minutes left. And for some reason, I'd been hitting it a lot in training and it was right there. I kept going. I need to get a finish. And then with like 20 seconds left, I just stepped into mount like nothing and then was like, God, I have to do it. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing with my stupid face there where I'm like, I. <laughs> and, you know, time ran out. And I was like, Ugh. I heard the, the 10 second, like, clack, clack, clack go. I'm just like, God, what have I done? Um, you know, in the last like three seconds, I was like, I guess I'd try for an arm bar. Because what else do you do when you have three seconds and you are clearly not going to stop them on strike. So that was going through my head right now. Like, you're an idiot. What have I done? I wasted the whole <laughs> fight. <laughs> that was that. 
that was so tense that moment that was incredibly tense watching it even it was like holy shit what is going on <laughs> alright Jose so uh, well actually Sarah describe the photo for the people who are listening online we, we have a new photo up describe what they're seeing sorry am I describing you cut yeah, out yeah give it Okay, so this this is actually the first. Uh, Esther sent me this photo, and I don't know how I hadn't seen it before. So this photo is from the second fight with Alexis Davis. Um, so it was my it was when we fought in Strike Force. So mm -hmm. we fought originally in Canada. Walking back out of the corner, this is the first time I was cut. So I had cut Alexis early in the in the in the round i'd throw him like this beautiful right elbow and was like oh it worked and i immediately started going like, Psh! and it like opened up and it was bleeding they they like, paused the fight doctor came in i was like okay i'm just gonna keep hitting it and then at some point she elbowed me or punched me i don't even know i think it might have been an elbow and it was like right in the the corner of my hairline and so then all of a sudden you know now i'm bleeding and uh, this is me walking back to the corner after a super, super fun round. Uh, and I don't know, the fact that I'm just staring straight into the lens is just such a cool, cool yeah. photo. It was, yeah, the first time I saw it was when Esther sent it to me, um, you know, when I when I kind of put up some photos from the fight. So, uh, yeah, it's just an amazing photo and just like a moment that I won't forget. Just walking back to the corner and being like, all right, we're in a fight. It's happening. <laughs> Actually, I just want to point out you have, you have a really cool outfit on. Yeah, yes. what is uh, what's going on with this? What's what's that logo? <laughs> Blowout, Blowout cards. cards. Blowout cards. Blowout cards. <laughs> um, you know, and the fact that I'm wearing white shorts is always a great choice for someone with such pale legs. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't my choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next photo. That's a really cool photo, isn't it? It's so cool. Oh, I love this photo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh this is actually from my first fight with leslie smith um it was in between strike force and ufc pretty much uh you know sean shelby had said hey uh feel free to go get a win because we don't want to use you until you've had a win essentially not in so many words but you know they wanted i had just lost to ronda uh which i do think had i won the fight with ronda in August of 2012, I do not think that females would have been brought into the UFC because there is zero. Well, there's like a 2% chance that Dana White would have put his money on me. And by 2%, wow. I mean like maybe 0.2%. Um, and for sure, you know, losing that enabled, you know, Ronda to be like, Oh, look how amazing she is. Uh, she just dismantled the former <laughs> champion. So, you know, I feel like I did my part. <laughs> I, I, it very was, it's so upsetting, but I did my part and, uh, helped the sport grow by silver lining, taking one in the, on the arm and embarrassing myself in front of the world. But that being said, this Leslie Smith <laughs> fight, uh, you know, we, we took the fight. I always knew that Leslie was going to be like a tough fight in the sense that she's just like gritty and grinding and, and kind of unorthodox and like not very good, but also good. Like it's, just like a fight you're never going to look good in for the most part. You're just going to have to like grit it out, get in there and fight. And so this whole fight, you know, she's much taller than I am. Shocking. Everyone I fight is taller. Uh, but so she was much taller and she kept using, like kept trying to head kick me repeatedly. Um, and so for the most part, I kept blocking them. And then at one point I just stepped back. And as I stepped back out of range, it was like within her big toe range. And so her big toe like slapped across my chin and for whatever reason turned and, and twisted, I guess I was too relaxed, twisted my face enough that it dropped me. Like it, I instantly just fell down. And so I was cheering as I was going down clearly. Uh, so I cheered Leslie saying, good job. And then down I fell. And then as soon as I was on my butt, I was fine. But, uh, it's just such a hilariously great moment. Uh, in my fighting career, like the fact that it's captured and that I look like such an idiot uh, <laughs> is so phenomenal. And again, Esther Lynn. Is that, oh, another one. Is this after your Roxanne fight? Yeah, 
so that's Roxanne on the floor there. Um, and oh, yeah. granted, I did a really stupid dance. Like I, I, I'm essentially doing stupid things in almost all of these photos. But so this was really close to Victoria. It was like just, I think it was Kent, Washington. So I had like a group of, I don't know, maybe 30 people drive down on this big bus. They like rented a bus and they drove down to the fight. And so right at the end of this fight, um, I pretty much was able to turn to like the crowd that was sitting and that were like all my students and all my teammates uh, and do my little happy jumping dance where I like flip my fingers around like a, a broken butterfly uh, and point my toes and just jump three or four times up in the air. Uh, so that was kind of this moment was I had just, uh, it was the third round and Roxanne and I, you know, not necessarily the most exciting fight. It was kind of like stuck on the cage a little bit. Um, and then she tried to arm bar me and I decided, you know, I'll just stand up. And then as I stood up, she kept holding. I was like, I guess I'll just put her back down. Uh, so I slammed her back down and then, uh, this was the result. And, you know, I've trained with her quite a bit since then, cause she's down at syndicate and she's down at, uh, in Las Vegas. And so I've gone down to help her train and help Joanne train and, and train with her quite a bit. And this has come up a couple times. And, uh, the, the last time it came up, John Wood was trying to make a joke. Um, cause I think Roxanne said, Oh, you know, I've never been, I've never been knocked out from punches. And then John said like, Oh yeah, just Sarah picked you up and slammed you on your head on the floor. I guess that's <laughs> And she was so mad. And I was like, John, come on. Like, we're literally standing inside the cage together talking. And, I mean, it's 10 years ago, and it happens. You know, you win some, you lose some. But, oh, I was just like, oh, John, come on. Anyways, funny story. But that was a good moment uh, and probably one of the most recognizable in my career uh, in terms of a, a pretty crazy finish. Okay, and this one might be a little difficult for you to remember, but see if you, you can pick out this photo, Sarah. <laughs> so this, I actually, on my walk here today, I was thinking about this photo. Um, so this photo was taken after the Jessica I fight. Um, so it was my first fight in the UFC. I had originally, I was supposed to fight Sarah McMahon. Uh, she pulled out of the fight. Jessica I took the fight on short notice, but it was still a full camp. Um, it was in Texas. Mm -hmm. which is the worst place to fight in the whole world when it comes to judging. I will never want to fight there ever again. Um, and, and so, yeah, this was at the end of the fight. I mean, I very clearly thought that I won the fight. I knew that the first two rounds were closer. Uh, the third round, I just, like, lay a beat down uh, and then came back a split decision. I was like, wow, that's surprising. And then I think right after this photo... Uh, I think Ariel Hawani actually came up to me and said, oh, just so you know, um, one of the judges gave the third round to Jessica I, and that's what lost you the fight. And so, uh, you know, it was probably one of the times where I lost but didn't feel like I lost. I wasn't actually that upset after. I was just like, that's a bummer. I got paid half my money. It now says I lost when I didn't lose. Um, but overall with the fight, I was I was okay. But then... I had this sweet, sweet shiner um, under my left eye. And so we took this really awesome photo of me pointing because I find bruises and black eyes hilarious. <laughs> do you, uh, do, do you know when you, when that, that, that got overturned to a no contest, right? That fight later right. on. Right. Do you get uh, any, like, when you hear that news, are you like, yay, it's a, it's a no contest now? Or what goes through your mind? Like, um, I mean, it got overturned to a no contest, not because they reviewed the judging, which I think that there yeah, should be some it was marijuana, process right? for that. Um, yeah, it was because she tested positive for, for marijuana and then was like, oh, I didn't smoke it. I was in a house with someone who did. I'm like, dude, who cares? You smoked it. Stupid decision because, you know, these are the limits and you're over them. You didn't play within it. You get it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so when I saw I got over to no contest, I actually found out like I find out most things uh, from like the media and social media and Twitter and who, everyone being like, oh, sweet, your fight to no contest. And I was like, what? So I thought I, I didn't know what it was about. And then, uh, you know, it was because of the, the marijuana. And in some ways, I'm glad that it got overturned because I didn't think that I deserved to have a loss for that fight. Um, but I also feel like I should have had a win. And so while it does say a no contest, it doesn't say I lost that fight. 
I know that I didn't get the pay that I would have if I had won. I also know that it affects your trajectory in how they now match you up for your next fights. And for me, it was a huge effect. Um, I literally got, I, I didn't get any opportunities for much longer than I would have if I had won that fight. Um, you know, so, so it, it, the trickle down effect, while it doesn't say I, I, I lost, it also didn't give me the opportunities that I would have had if I'd had the win. Well, you're not wrong about Texas either. That that card we were talking about with all these scorecards all, all over the place was Houston. Oh, uh, so that's yeah, that's where that horrible. stemmed from. I think uh, J- that's the fight James Krause took on like 24 hours notice. Had his opponent yeah. in an arm bar for four and a half minutes. Loses the first round on one of the ju- on one of the judges' scorecards. Turns out that judge got a black belt from James Krause's coach. So conflict of interest to say the least. Not James yeah. Krause's opponent. And- his opponent. His opponent's coach. Yeah, yeah. his opponent's coach. Houston, yeah. right? Houston. Yeah. Yeah. Houston. Where, where was, Casey's uh, from. That was uh, the Lauren Murphy Andrea Lee fight happened on that one. That one had a lot of people talk about the main event. That was the John Jones Dominic Reyes. A lot of people think Dominic Reyes won. But if you look at the that one, if you look at the media, it was still pretty even. A lot of people still think John Jones won. Right. I don't know a lot of people that think Lauren Murphy won that fight, especially if you go back and look at the MMA decisions. I think it's like 90% of the people think Andrea Lee won, but the Texas judges gave it to Lauren Murphy. So a lot of weird judging that whole entire night. Yeah, and the fact that there really is no recourse for it. Like right. their judging directly affects the careers and the trajectories and the, and the, you know, the monetary value and, and so many factors of the sport. And the fact that there can be this many, what really should be considered like pretty horrible decisions and that rounds don't get overturned. There's no review of them. And even if they do review like, ah, yeah, you didn't do a good job. That doesn't translate back. Like you can't mm-hmm. retroactively change that. Right. I, I think that for sure is a huge issue with the system. Um, because yeah, they could have a conflict of interest. They could know almost nothing about the sport, but have taken a course mm-hmm. to now be a judge uh, and not really understand the in- intricacies. There's just a lot that that's kind of packaged into that job. And it is a very serious job. And you even see what was the one card where there was like a guy who was supposed to be watching and Joe Rogan's yelling about how the guy Houston. was like on I, his phone. I think that was the Houston card. I think that was that same card. Maybe it was the same card, but like, he's not even watching the fight. The fight's happening. You're not even what you're on your phone. Like you're th- getting paid and you're affecting people's careers. I think that I think was the right. Andrew Lee fight. Yeah, it was the Lauren Murphy fight. It was. That was the Lauren Murphy Andrew Lee fight. Yeah. It was later proven though that he was looking at an iPad, like he was watching the fights on an iPad. Right? They give you an iPad so you get an alternate right. view, apparently. But um, no, I just I feel like like look, you're completely right about Texas, and that night was a huge spotlight. But you know. Like, there is some great judges out there as well. So I always like I get annoyed when people say the media is bullshit, and I'm like, well, fuck me. Like I mean, I'm working every hour of every day. Well, so I, I do think everyone is else good. is pretty good. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Keep up the great work, Texas judges. <laughs> great work on that Jessica I fight. <laughs> <laughs> Cold blooded. Some nice judges out there though. Just for the from Maria. <laughs> Gronin, I apologize if I m- mispronounce your name. From the YouTube comments, Sarah, what is your favorite dance move when you go out dancing? So remember earlier when I said I'm a super big loner and sure. I like to be alone? I do not go out. Like, given the option, I do not go out um, pretty much ever. I just like to be at home. I like to train. I like to be at home. And that's pretty much it. Um, now, granted, I teach a lot and we often have music on and I'm always just doing idiotic there's no specific dance move that I do. I just bounce around and literally <laughs> I'm just an idiot at all times. Uh, I'm a, like for sure a fan of like the boy band moves. Sure. I like to do a, to, to do a good rendition of a boy band or a, yeah. I mean, I just bounce around like an idiot. Um, I what grew up a, dancing. What would be a boy, a boy band move? I mean, come on. Well, I mean, you know, there's like the. Yes. There's like there's yes. so many. Da, 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 da. There's so many good moves. Yeah. Um, but I, I perpetually tap dance because I grew up dancing. Uh, and so everywhere I go, I just like to make rhythms with my feet. And most people I know hate it a lot. 
but I love it. Like I'm, I'm right always there with you. you. My dad has yelled at me my entire life growing up because I'm always tapping my feet no matter where I go. Yeah. I just want to dance, Dad. I just want to dance. Yeah, seriously, man. <laughs> I just want to dance. I don't want to watch sports. Let me dance. That's those Irish jeans. That's the Lord yeah, of the Dance true. coming out with you. I was like, that's yes. real true. Oh, I loved, I loved Irish dance. When like river dance was a big thing, I took Irish step dance and I loved it. Yeah, Michael Flatley's my cousin. No, what he's not. Yeah, no, yeah, but I mean, that wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna. Okay, we, you know, we got. We're at an hour. We got lots of questions, so we're gonna. Since people submitted these questions, we're gonna fly through them pretty fast. So um, rapid fire, okay. like rapid it. fire. Before we go to our promo, hold on. That's not thank you, Maria, for the question. All right, one moment. Do 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 do. Hi, Sarah. From Trumbo on the site. Since PFL season is off, which sucks, wondering if other promotions get started earlier than PFL, are you free to take fights elsewhere? Also, if you got any rematch you wanted from your career so far, who would it be? Um, okay, so, uh, I mean, I am under contract with PFL, so I'm not sure what that would look like. I'm sure that if I were given an opportunity and wanted to take it, I could talk with them given that I'm fighting at 155 for PFL and I would prefer to fight at 135 in my own division. Um, but who knows who's going to get started and what that looks like even. Um, so that I, I'm not sure of, but I would look into it if the option or the opportunity was right. Um, in terms of a rematch, oh, I, I mean, pretty much any of my losses I'd like to have back. You know, like I'd love to fight Ronda again because I could have just done so much better, but she's out. Um, I would, of course, love to fight Valentina again, because that was... I don't think it would be a super fun fight. I do think it would be a pretty boring fight, because she just has like that ability to pace and uh, slow a fight down and almost lull you into a sense of boredom, and then she does something really impressive. Um, so I wouldn't be necessarily excited in terms of actually fighting, um, but the person I'd like to fight the most would be Misha Tate. Um I don't know. I just, even though I won our first fight, I would just like to fight her again. Uh, I just pushed for that for years and made an awesome cupcake smashing video. Um, it was, I don't know. It was just a fight that she just has a face you want to hit. Wow. <laughs> oh, damn. Holy shit, Sarah. <laughs> Oh Thank God. you for the question, Trumbo, and for bringing out that side of Sarah. <laughs> that was amazing, yeah. <laughs> From Sports Week MMA on Twitter, I'd ask Sarah, how many times per year does she feel is optimal for fighters? I was thinking in terms of striking balance between earning money, recovery, and just wanting, waiting for a good opportunity to naturally create itself. Hashtag crystal myth. Not even going to respond to that. Uh, so, Sarah, what, is the mo what, does, what do you feel is the most optimal amount of fights for a fighter to take per year? Uh, for me, I would say like three is pretty awesome. Um, three kind of gives you ample time to train, get or get better first, like work on skills, have your fight, perform in the fight, recover, kind of do it again, and and hopefully make some adjustments in between. Uh, four, like for me, I love fighting, so four would be great, but it is a lot on the body, and if there's an injury within that. Uh, that can be hard to to keep that schedule having four. Um, and also, you're not really making many gains in terms of your technical improvement. So I think three is probably, like, perfect in terms of being able to still improve uh, and make the changes you need to to stay healthy. Uh, I think one is definitely not enough. Two is, like, bare minimum, but still not really enough. Three is kind of like that, that perfect window where you're probably not overtraining too much uh, and can still get better in between. From Mark Krabzak on oh, Twitter. On these, okay, sorry, go ahead. Been watching old UFC cards and can't handle the Rogan Goldberg com combination. Uh, who are your favorite commentators or combination in MMA UFC? My personal favorite is Michael. I can never pronounce his name wrong. Chavello. Michael Chavello. Uh, yeah, yeah. He has been good since the HD Net fight nights. Hashtag the A side. So, uh, PT, Sarah, Casey, your favorite commentator combinations. Uh, I don't Rob know. Wharton. Josh Palmer, Cage Warriors. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I was just saying, I don't really know who goes. I get so confused because a lot of the voices sound the same, and I'm never sure of who's talking at what time. 
I, I really like Paul Felder's commentary. I like John Anik. Um, I, I enjoy actually a lot of the fighters who they've been having, like Paul Felder. I like DC. Um, I like Dominic Cruz as well in, in some ways, but I think Paul Felder um, comes off quite easily, you know, easy and flowing with, with his commentary. And does he normally partner with Anik or who does he normally partner he, with? Uh, I've, in my, he's done a lot with Anik. I think he's done some with Cruz too. But my in my mind, I just picture him next to Anik a lot. Yeah, me too. So I guess maybe them, but I'm sure there's others who are pretty good. Casey, your com- your favorite combo, quickly. Um, my my combo I would like to see would be uh, Mar Ronaldo with yes as play by play and color commentary by Dominic Cruz. I think that's a good mix of personalities. That I would like- be. I like that, but with uh, DC instead of Cruz. I kind of like the. It would dry, just be. I like, I like, I like the dryness of Cruz with the over the top of Morrow, but DC is a good one too. I think it would just turn into full on like professional wrestling commentating if we got DC and Morrow, and I would love every second of it. PC, quickly, your favorite. I love the cage warriors guys. Just want to give them a shout out. Josh, Josh Palmer and Brad Wharton, they're great. And I don't really mind all that much. It doesn't like. I mean, I particularly enjoy that. But I, I never really am watching a UFC card going, oh, this commentary is so bad. I, I don't get that. I see everybody calling for people's jobs every Sunday morning. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? That's my two cents. There you go. All right. well, our Thank last you, question. Mark. Oh, that was from who is that? Mark. Yeah. Mark Krabzak. That wasn't right. <laughs> Ask the panel on Instagram, next five UFC champions to lose their belt. That's a lot. Pizza, you want to take That's this That's a one? lot of champions. That's a lot of champions. Uh, if Cejudo fights Jan, maybe. There you go. Um, uh, I think John Jones in dodgy territory at the moment. I don't know. I don't. Like, I think he's unbelievable. I think he's the best in the division by a long shot. It's just everything that's happening in the last two performances – I think that could be a good time, but again, it's John Jones. He's the greatest. Um, oh, I don't think Izzy's going to lose it. Um, Usman's got a lot of competitive fights around him. I mean, the Colby fight was close until it wasn't. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't think Habib is losing his title anytime soon, lightweight, even though the Tony fight is amazing. Um, I don't think Volkanovski is either. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think I think Cejudo, like, I there guess the reason why I'm saying... Did, yeah, you know. the ladies. Yeah, I know, but Valentin, Valentina isn't losing it, um, I don't think, anytime soon. Hey, I don't I think Amanda say, Nunes don't, is don't either. Don't sleep on uh, Felicia Spencer against Amanda Nunes. I think that's a lot tougher of a fight than people than people uh, people aren't giving I Felicia just, Spencer enough credit. I, oh, you thought I was joking of that tweet, Sarah? When I, I thought, yeah, I did. I no, legitimately, Casey I, tweeted that, and I was like, are you being funny? I think, I think there's like... Any, I, have you have you you've seen Nunes like in her bad fights, right? Like, and I think Spencer's a horrible yeah. matchup for her. I think. Yeah, I mean Spencer's tough, but I think that Nunes at this point her range is really good. That I think Felicia's going to have a hard time like getting in there and just holding on to her. Not impossible. Um, and Felicia is very good on the ground, um, but I I I don't think it's going to be. Uh, I would still put my money on Nunes. I, I do, the women's I champions are really dominant. Like the, at the moment, like I mean, there's there's savages mm-hmm. at the top of every division. That's just like I mean, it's it's just hard to see someone beating uh, Zhang. It's, some, it's hard to beat someone see someone beating Nunes or Valentina at the moment, as far as I'm concerned. Especially after Joanna and Wei Li, like that was fucking crazy. That like, was, what do you have that to do? was insane. It was so amazing to watch. Wei Li has a has a tough tasks ahead of her with if they get the, if she ever fights Rose I think Tat, Tatiana Suarez has been hurt for a long time so she was at one point yeah. the scariest fighter in that whole division and now that she hurt her neck she's kind of waiting to heal up while while the champion is active I think Tatiana Suarez is a, is the boogie woman of that division whenever she comes back yeah, yeah. very tough fight okay now we don't have any more questions but I'm going to roll a video, oh. and this is a special gift for Sarah. Now, you won't be able to hear it, Sarah, but you're going to recognize it because of the way the feed works, but our audience will be able to hear it, Okay. unfortunately. So, uh, <laughs> Unfortunately. You are welcome to everyone out there. <laughs> so, uh, so here it goes. Hold on. Hold on a second. 
Go ahead. I want to make you smile whenever you're sad. Carry you around. Oh, I, I screwed it up. Around. Yeah, what did you say? A ride? <laughs> Who says that? I want to carry you a ride. Shit. Okay. Idiot. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> Take you. Are you ready? Um, yeah. Beautiful. I want to make you smile whenever you're sad. Carry you around when your arthritis is bad. All I want to do is grow old with you. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Well done. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Sarah. That's amazing. Uh, How long have you been sitting on that, that, Casey? Yeah, not you. Uh, uh, that was the only reason I, I. That was the only reason I invited Sarah in the show, to be honest. I, that is fair. That's from ten years ago in October. Yep. Crazy. Wow. And I and I told you like we shot that. Uh, cause at the t I, I was covering a strike force event at the time, and we shot that. I think I think you wound up losing that fight, right? That was my very first loss. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, wah, wah. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. I remember I shot it. You were like, "Oh no, you can't air that." I was like, okay. "I was like, okay, just win the fight, and then we'll throw it out there." And like, yeah. like a dummy, you, you lost the fight on purpose just so I wouldn't air the dang video. Uh, uh, that was the first thrown fight. Uh, yeah, so. All right, whatever. Uh, we'll just, oh, well, <laughs> that was great. Well, after get Brian you. Kelleher back on, we can uh, get a musical rendition of the A side going. Yes, yes, a ukulele player, a fine ukulele player. Really, it's good to know. Yeah. yeah. And right, is right. that it for questions, Casey? Yeah, we good. We good. We good. We went 15 minutes over, but that's okay because it's not well, like we, we can got, go we anywhere got, got anyway. One, que one, qu one question, one more. I want because I want to know the answer to this. I'm gonna throw it on the screen right now. Can you read it? From Esther Lynn. Uh, I am actually curious what Sarah benches. Um, well, I'm currently wearing bench tights, actually. You know, like the brand. Wow. There you go. Well, Very nice. So, it's a good question. Um, I'm not like a crazy super strong. Like I would say, I don't know, like 65 kilos. We're, we're from America. What is that? We're from America. That's like 140 a, pounds. Yeah. Like, like, for, and that would be for like a couple. So I, I could probably do like my own body weight, like 150 maybe. Not that impressive. I know I'm working on it. What's your deadlift, bro? Oh, my deadlift's pretty good actually. That's like probably closer to like, where I never really do max efforts, but probably like 250, 300 pounds. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, big butt. Don't lie. <laughs> I really need to get a bigger arse. My, 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 I'm really lacking in the ass section. I mean, it's like, it just goes straight down from my back. Like, I don't have arms. Not there. me. I got a big one. Look. <laughs> like, what has happened to this show? Like, just, I can't really. That's, that's pretty happening. good. Casey, you're happening. next. Mine's like... Lovely. That's a nice hoop you have. You gotta work on it. You gotta work on it. No, it's it's decent. Mine's real bad. It's, yeah, his is horrible. I mean, yeah, mine's not. I mean, I don't. I mean, I wouldn't like. But like, you're flexible, so you have that going for you, I guess. But I reckon that everyone thinks that because I'm so flexible, that's why I don't put any muscle on my ass. Because I'm I'm using my legs. Like I'm not activating my core. I'm just using my legs all the time. Apparently. And your back Maybe. just kind of splits into two. Eventually, yeah, it's, it's awesome. love handles. It's it's all the all the 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 meat that should be on my ass has gone to my love handles. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. My butt just gets exponentially bigger. Like the more cookies I eat, like the bigger it gets. It's a so problem. Is the way I should go. Maybe. Give me all some right. cookies. Take it. Take us out, Jose. What a world we live in. What a world. <laughs> But this is the Wednesday edition of the A-Side Live Chat. You can find us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. You name it, probably there. PT has his crystals in tow. I have my one crystal in tow. Uh, Sarah, dance. Dance, Sarah. Sarah and Casey are dancing. Uh, but for Jose, that's PC. That's Casey. That's Sarah. We'll be back on Friday at the normal time. 
Mm. We're out. We're out. <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> what? what? <laughs> well, that's definitely the first time we've all uh, compared asses 